Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Northampton Planning Board meeting of May 23rd, 2024. Um, just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We're also, we're here in, cha in uh, council chambers. We're also uh, have a audience, an online audience via Zoom. Um, we have a couple of items on the agenda. One is a uh, site plan amendment up at 140 Woodland Drive in Florence. And we're also going to have a discussing about the planning board meeting formats. And then we have a few A&Rs to consider. Um, at this point, we would like to open up the podium, so to speak, for anyone who has any comments for issues that are or items, topics that are not on the planning board agenda for today. And we'll start with the, the public and council chambers. And if you just state your name and address, that would be great. Nancy Mahavik, I'm at 51 Bay Ave. If you probably remember, I'm one of the abutters to the 39 Bay Ave project. And as I'm also sure you remember, the planning board approved the site plan for 39 Bay Ave with conditions. And I'll tell just a few of them. At least 15 days prior to submittal of the building permit, the applicant shall submit final revised construction plans. The revised plan shall include a final tree location abutting north lot line and any change location of the parking as necessary based on where the line is determined the tree is determined to be b tree protection details that determined by the applicant's arborist for the tree line along the northern lot line and c certification by the applicant's arborist that the tree protection has been installed in accordance with the recommendations by the so those were the conditions that you would agree to, among others. Uh, I'd like to address those points, plus one other regarding uh, drainage. So because we have at least three boundary trees, I've hired an arborist to write a report on three of the four trees on the north border of uh, the north property line. And that report will estimate the CRZ for each tree and outline a process for determining the actual CRZ as you probably know, you can't really determine the actual CRZ until you determine the root widths at various points. The report will also detail how each tree should be protected and outline what construction activities can and cannot occur within the CRZ. So just this afternoon, the developer informed me today that she had contacted an arborist regarding the tree, and she does agree that it is an, uh, a boundary tree and will not be removed and the plans will be revised. Because we'll be dealing with two reports, I assume her arborist will prepare a report since it's required in your conditions. I would like the planning board to require either someone from planning and sustainability or the tree warden to meet with the developer and myself to sit down, go through the reports, determine a plan uh, to find, figure out what the actual CRZ is, uh, the tree protection for all three trees, what site plan revisions are required, and what monitoring of, of tree protection is required. Uh, I'm concerned that since communication with the developer has been extraordinarily difficult, uh, that unless we have an impartial person involved in that discussion, uh, we're not likely to get very far with it and we could end up with legal proceedings, which I'm hoping will not have to take place. So I'd ask the planning board to require or suggest that planning or the tree warden be involved in a discussion with us. The second issue uh, is that in its 425 comments, the DPW indicated that the site plan, and I'm not sure this was brought up at the meeting last time, but the site plan needs to be revised to provide additional grading details and or grain structures to specify how all stormwater flows, all stormwater flows, including root flows, uh, will reach DO1 and the subsurface retention system. Those details were not provided in the four, um, the plan that was written on about 419 and presented on 425. And the DPW clearly required us that as a condition for approval. Um, we, we feel that these issues require more extensive site plan changes than simply shifting around the parking space or two. Uh, they will likely include changes in grading since Tree protection, uh, the CRZ protection generally requires that no fill be put in, no standard fill be put in on top of tree roots. It has to be specialized fill. So this will require additional 
uh, changes in the site plan beyond what was in your conditions. Uh, these changes could also impact how the stormwater will flow into DO1, and therefore we're potentially requesting a planning board hearing on that revised site plan or whatever process is normally involved when a site plan is revised beyond what's required by your conditions. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. So just a reminder, it's board policy of public comment. We don't really respond to that. I'm sure your points have been made and Carolyn's noted them and I'm sure there'll be further action. So appreciate you coming tonight. Um, so now I'll open it up to any comments uh, of those people who are participating online. If anyone would like to make public comment about an item that's not on our agenda. Um, those will be texted to the chat room, and Carolyn or I will will read them. You got it. No, and I don't know mine's enabled. I just see everyone here. Uh, so, it is a it okay. Yeah. And yep. it was the requirement is that either goes to the chair or staff. Yep. Yep. Okay, so you said you don't see anything. No, I don't see anything. So last chance out there in the online world. Okay, we'll move on to our public hearing today, which is a site plan amendment for additional tree removal for solar access by Habitat for Humanity at 140 Woodland Drive, map ID 4231, permit LU 24-16. It's a site plan review, so we need a simple majority of four of our seven members, and we have five of the seven members here tonight. Um, so is there a presentation?
programs of the Zero Energy Ready Home Program, if possible. We um, began clearing the lot um, based on the original site plan approval this over this winter with help from the Smith Vocational Forestry uh, students. So they cleared the sort of inside area where the house is going to be that was on the original site plan and some of the trees to the south. And then it created this sort of a tunnel effect because of the tall trees that are on the east and the west. So we asked PV Squared, which is the solar installation company that we work with, to come out and do a solar shading analysis after that initial clearing on the lot had been completed. And this picture here shows that there are trees over to the left. That is the west side of the property. Right now, this is sort of looking due south and trees um, to the east that are um, creating significant shading. So in this yellow area, um, wherever you see kind of a grayed out area, that shading is affecting the solar production possibilities for this house. Um, they took a uh, estimated energy use from a identical building we've built on another site and then compared that to the what could be generated on this roof We've already redesigned the roof to use every square inch possible um, while still meeting fire codes, which require a walking path now along the edge of the roof, and found that opening up the east and west really helps with the fall and, and the winter sun um, when the sun is at a lower angle in the sky and would allow to meet the production goals over the course of a year. Um, the a yellow line here is estimated solar production and the blue is estimated usage with usage being in the higher in the winter for an all electric heated home. And um, usually when we do these graphs, it's got a peak in the middle in the summer, but there's still some shading from trees across the street to the south and other areas that aren't gonna go away. But getting that shading from the east and the west during the winter will allow us to meet those production goals. Um, so these are the really tall trees that are on the east side of the property um, along the property line with the neighbor, Alicia Ralph. Um, trees about one through six were part of that shading analysis. Um, at seven, eight, and nine are kind of parallel to the house or just behind it. So they don't make as much of an impact on the solar but they would be orphaned with these extremely tall trees less than 50 feet from their house. And we worry about the long-term stability of these trees and the potential cost of removal after a house is built. Um, removing them at this stage would be much more cost-effective and reduce risk for the low-income home buyer um, who's gonna be moving in. Um, tree number 10 is an oak tree, not a pine that is kind of directly behind the house location. And I think that tree could be preserved. Um, we did consult with an arborist about those trees along uh, the Eastern line. Um, while they seem in general good health, he did uh, agree that the activity of construction and the destabilization that would occur by removing the other trees along with the risks, the benefits of solar and the risks of the future homeowner, um, that he agreed that it made sense to have those trees removed. Um, I also talked with the neighbors at 763 and 755 West Hampton Road, and I believe they both submitted letters to the board. I don't know when you guys got those. Um, I'm sure that they would rather have a forest behind their house still, um, but they are uh, reasonable people who realize that's not an option. They're gonna have a house. And the neighbor at 755, actually there were more trees in that row previously, but they fell down in a windstorm and damaged her garage. So she has personal experience with that particular line of trees falling and is uh, shares our concerns about that.
So uh, they would rather see us plant um, some buffers, uh, plantings that aren't going to grow tall. And that's what the new Berkshire design plan is showing is some trees that won't get taller than 30 feet that will remain low or bushes to help with some privacy screening. Um, kind of already talked. And then on the west property line, that's the side of, near the street, um, we have, um, you can see there's a few trees here near the sidewalk that are closer to that southern property line. And we have marked five of those with yellow tape that we would like to remove. These ones are all set back from and not public shade trees. Um, the we in the background you can see we put tree protection around um, three oak trees that will be near the driveway, and those um, we would like to keep um, there further enough back from that side solar shading that I don't think they'll be an issue. So this uh, shows the protected oaks near the driveway. And this is showing our proposed um, plant. These are the three protected oaks near the driveway. This is tree number 10 over here in the bottom right that we said we would preserve. And then these sort of clump onto the east and south are some naturalistic plantings um, along those property boundaries. Are there any questions? Can you, can you just tell us order related questions? We're the right now the house is located pretty centrally, so I don't think there's anywhere else on the site that we could do a ground mounted solar. Does anyone, I, mean, I, I know that the solar companies don't like to do that position. Where we do the cost of building. Building the, the, the frame for the yeah the array. But to the south of the house, this is a leach field. It's not on town sewer, so there is a septic here. And anything to the in front of the house to moving closer to the south would still have that same east-west shading that we've sort of we've we've cleared a tunnel to the south but there's shading on either side. And to the north is um, still uh, wooded, that this area outside of the sort of disturbed area of the project. I think I saw some, I think I saw some numbers about the amount of trees or the inches that you're going to replace. Um, and and I believe we're you're asking for a reduction in what we might ask a private developer, and and that's because of the the addition of the solar array and net zero. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, so you have to so the um, because it came in as an affordable housing project, it has essentially a built in. Um, waiver from the requirement of providing um, the replacement trees under the rep replacement calculation. So the, the language is that to the extent feasible, new trees should be planted, but it's not, they're not required to plant. Um, now, the other lot that was part of this development that allowed the reduction of um, frontage for the purposes of creating affordable housing is a market rate lot. If that applicant comes in to remove trees, they would be held to the standard for um, um, re tree replacement. Yeah. Thank you. And as I travel around that neighborhood, there's certainly areas of wooded areas, but also the, the, the yards seem to have a similar kind of look as what proposed with large oak trees spaced along the lawn. Um, and things of that nature. It's not all wooded, just kind of carved out a uh, house footprint. Um, and 
the possible, I'm just looking at your last bullet point here, the possible addition of any new public shade trees on the property line to be determined in coordination with the tree warden, meaning that those would be on the, the easement, the town easement? Yes. And yes. part of the public tree kind of improvement plan. Right. So we didn't show any on the west side near the sidewalk because we um, would want to do that in coordination directly with the tree warden if they wanted to have trees there. And as, as long as they were short trees and not going to grow tall to shade, then it would accomplish this, you know, our, yep. that would be mm -hmm. fine. Other questions from board members? I have a question for Caroline about something in this staff report. You wrote that some thinning has been done on the west side that borders the road, but the agreement with the neighbors was that these trees would remain as a partial screen. Can you <laughs> clarify that? Um, so there was um, a cover up uh, before the permitting for this property, there were um, planning office reached out to the neighborhood about the creation of these lots. And so it was um, stipulated there be essentially trees to the extent possible would remain between the street and the clearing of the lot. So that's um, why there aren't, um, the trees along the street should really remain just, and because that went through the, I mean, ultimately the planning board approved that, but that was, um, situation was designed with um, intention to uh, maintain some street, some trees along the street. But that's not what's being requested. The other ones are that, and the only thing that is of issue are some trees that came out in, or one tree that was taken that was in the right of way. And that's what Megan was referring to is, um, replanting for the removal of a public shade tree. Okay, so just to clarify, it sounds like there isn't a proposal to be doing any more removal from the west side ex other than the public shade tree that's already... No, I, I we did include five trees on the west side. Yes. Um, there... Um, in between the protected trees and the south border. So because when we looked at that shading analysis, you can see that there there's significant shading. This The most significant shading is the east. That covers a good third or quarter of the area. But there was also shading on the, the right, which is the west side that was affecting the production. So the the calculation that was done assumed removal of some of the east and west trees. And the west trees, my orientation is a little bit off. Yeah. What lies along the, the public right of way, the street. Correct. Okay. And, and the ones that we're proposing to remove are along the street side, but not in the public right of way. Right. Correct. There was one tree next to the proposed driveway that had a uh, we made a mistake. It was uh, two inches into the right of way, and not most of it. So I made it. We made a mistake. And it looks like the majority of the trees that you're asking to remove are white pines. Yes. Tall, thin. Yep. And when you, I mean, there was that graph of usage. Sam, your mic. Um, the the there was this graph of the usage versus the um, the what you get with the solar. Does that take into account? I mean, if you're if you're cutting down trees, then you, your usage will one hundred percent go up because there's now less shade. I think that the primary load is it heating, not cooling. And yes, trees help with the cooling load. But I think more of the electric usage is being shown through the winter. Um, which would indicate more usage during those the heating season. Um, I'm sorry. So the blue is the usage, right. which is down the through summer. the summer and down from. It's a little confused because I guess it doesn't include. 
so it just peaks from January to February. Yeah, or December through February, it's kind of going up there. You know, as it gets colder. Have you, have you told them to wear a sweater? Yeah. <laughs> you can give slippers too, but I think they still need to generate some solar. Uh, Got it. All right, other questions before we open it up to the public? So, um, stand by at okay. this point. We'll ask if there's anyone, uh, there's no one in council chambers. So if there's anyone participating online who have uh, want to make a text comment at this point about the presentation, the application. I don't see any. Okay, all right. We won't close quite the public comment period yet, just so we can ask the African other questions. But any other questions from the board? I don't have any questions. I do have some experience in past projects with pines, very tall pines. And I do know that they can become very unstable, especially when you start to remove things around them. Um, and it, it's kind of um, unusual that we actually have the butters asking us to approve this usually it's the opposite um and so it, you know we kind of have this interesting situation of competing objectives like we want housing we want affordable housing we want all electric we want solar and we all want to save the trees and i think both of the abutters that wrote in explained that and to the applicant that you know nobody wants to cut these trees down but when you look at the bigger picture of what we're gaining. Um, I do believe these trees in a good windstorm like we've had um, recently could cause a lot of damage. So I, I personally see the upside of what they're asking for. Thanks. Right. Uh, and so, and the neighbor, so uh, the additional tree removal along the west property line does differ from what was originally kind of proposed the neighbors, but that same, I mean, we heard from the abutters, direct abutters, that they're fine with this, and presumably all a, a similar group of folks all got postcards and didn't come and didn't express any objections, so it's fair to assume that although this is a change, we haven't heard any objections to that piece of the change. That's correct. And also, Casey. and uh, um, and their um, habitat is proposed. Uh, and so that must be shown. Great. And they are retaining some of the larger oak trees that are in that same line because they don't impact the, the, the roof line, the solar insulation in the same way during the winter. Okay. Very good. So if we're all finished with questions for the applicant, is there a, a motion to close the public hearing? Public comment, thank you, not the public hearing. Second. Motion has been made by Sam Taylor. Seconded, we'll go with Stacy. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. I think it's unanimous. So the public comment period is closed. Any last comments, questions, remarks? I move to approve the site plan amendment at 140 Woodlawn, Woodland Road for um, additional tree removal with no conditions, right? Right, yep. Second. Motion's been made by Jana White, seconded by Melissa. What's that little piece of paper say, Melissa? <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? All right, all those in favor? All right, any opposed? Abstaining? You'll abstain, Sam? Okay, so four in favor, one abstention. Well, thank you very much. Good luck. We'll go build a house.
Yep. That's great. You've got quite a few projects going on. Yeah. 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 Exciting time. Keep those volunteers busy. Um, ready to move into the next part of our agenda? Talking about uh, discussing the format of our, our meetings, um, which again, doesn't need to be resolved and all tied up in a neat boat today. Um, but it's good that we're discussing this and moving it forward. Um, Chris had some good comments last meeting. Unfortunately, he's not here tonight. Um, David's not able to attend tonight. He sent some comments that Carolyn forwarded to us. Um, maybe we could, I'll, I'll read those aloud if people didn't get a chance to see those yet. Okay. Carolyn sent out in her uh, staff notes that email a nice description of a proposal of what the uh, a revised format could look like. I also sent out an, an email to the board just on some, you know, some language, some topics that we might want to look at also in terms of participation upon online participants and how we as board members might participate if we went to a hybrid format. Um, so this isn't a public hearing. There is a lot of public here who I'm sure want to weigh in about the merits of the board doing certain things. Um, how does the board feel about hearing comments from the public if they limit themselves to two minutes? Or would you rather just have a internal discussion ourselves? How many people? I don't well, I don't, yeah. They're going to all say the same thing. Okay. Anybody else feel like that? I, I personally feel like we should hear, and there are people who are very um, interested in this. If we, oh, by chat, that's right. I keep forgetting that. By chat. So they can chat and we'll read the chat. Uh, mostly they want to hear our discussion, I think. But if they took the time to come here tonight, I think we can at least give them the, the space to uh, they didn't come. give their comments. They didn't come to council chambers, right? Right. Well, that's the nature of our world now, right? It is a participation by Zoom. And we don't know why they decided to do that. But So at this point, I don't see any chat. Um so I and I think what people are probably waiting for, if I can make this assumption, is for our discussion, and then when we start narrowing things down, then they'll start chatting. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll just have our discussion. We'll make some kind of proposal. Um, we could write that up and make sure that David and Chris get a chance to see it, and then we could look at it again at our next meeting and maybe come to some kind of conclusion. Does that sound like a way to proceed, Carolyn? Yeah, it's up to you. I am. Um, yeah, I think it makes sense to sort of talk of sort of, um, you know, my I tried to summarize somewhat from the last meeting. I didn't get the minutes out. So um, and then also um, you can certainly think about David's comments as well. Um, but um you know, I think there was discussion last time about the importance of um, and the value of in-person dialogue and the ability to have that dialogue. Um, and um, but at the same time, there's obviously a convenience factor when some board members might not be able to make it, but they could if they were able to zoom in. Um, and so, again, you um, you obviously will want to make a decision that's um, helpful for um, deliberation and hearing public comments or getting them, you know, via letters, and which has always been allowed since the beginning of time. People have sent letters and they're part of the public record. And so they don't need to be, you know, um, repeated or voiced if someone sends a letter that it's the same weight. Um, and um, I think that's where we left it. Yep, yep. Um, 
There's also the, the, the piece about if we do go to a hybrid format and planning board members who aren't available to attend the meeting, and we might need them to attend either they're, they're interested and they can attend via Zoom, or we need them for a quorum, that if they attend, is it appropriate for them to also vote um, on the application at hand? Which I don't think there's any hard and fast rule about. Um, city council allows their members to vote if they're participating by uh, by hybrid, um, by Zoom. And I would personally, I would think the same thing. If I sit through the whole discussion on Zoom, and I have discussion with my other planning board members, I think I'm savvy enough to have a vote at that point. So that's another just another piece to consider as we walk through this. Not only how the public participates via Zoom, but how we as board members might do that. Not to say if I go away on vacation, I have to find time to participate in the planning board right. meeting only because it's by Zoom. <laughs> That's not a default. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be important to, I think the reason it was established that way initially is um, so that the board, I mean, the meeting essentially takes place in person. And so if then you had at which you could have different rules for board members versus the public. But I think um, if I recall, that was sort of the sentiment at that time. It wasn't that you weren't allowed to vote, but it was sort of establishing a protocol where everything sort of happens in person um, as opposed to across the Zoom platform. <clears throat> oh, I, for one, attend a lot of Zoom meetings, as do many of our board members in our daily lives. I certainly appreciate um, the efficiency of Zoom meetings. I, I, it, it allows me to work around the country from the convenience of my home. It can be incredibly efficient. Um, my personal preference is that I, I like doing them here in person. I think we had a lot of dialogue back and forth last meeting about, um, I'm, I'm with David. I, I could go either way on that verse, you know, per, in person or on Zoom. I personally, my preference is to be here. And I think if we're going to be here, my suggestion would be that this is where it's held. This is the primary location that the hearing is held and that the presenters are here with us. Um, priority goes to the folks that are here. I think that we've had some conversation about those here in chambers will get the first opportunities to speak. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we should be having any presentations um, given to us over Zoom by applicants. Uh, personally, I mean, they worked when we were in COVID, but it's more cumbersome. It's great to have them here, the applicants, and to be able to um, have a good flow of conversation with them. I don't have any issues with having folks on Zoom talk to us, um, but I, yeah, but I think that like. I think this is where the meeting is. And if we have technical difficulties, I haven't been able to keep this thing on all night. And if we have te technical difficulties, we're not, you know, moving the meeting or, you know, uh, be, because like, like if you, if it's really important for you to say something, then you, sh then you come here. Otherwise we could have a technical difficulty and Zoom's not working that night. Like what happens if Zoom's not working? Are we, you know, moving our meeting? Um, yeah, so yeah, that actually, so I uh, following on those comments, a technical question, if we've advertised on the agenda that it's a hybrid meeting with a zoom link, and then we have a technical failure, and we can't get zoom working, or the mics are dying, which is completely outside of our control, have we vi are we in danger of violating open meeting law, because then people can't join in a way that we advertise that they could? Yeah, well, it, I think it also depends on where the board members are. If you're allowing board members to zoom in as part, of, even though this is the primary location, if someone has a child care emergency or something like that, and they can only do it from home, then I think um, in if that's the way it's set up, then you'd have to repost it to another time. Um, I don't know if you're only taking 
all the meeting, you know, everything in person, I'd have to double check on whether, you know, it may be that we just advertise it differently or post it differently, I should say, and advertise it differently. Yeah. I did note, uh, thank you, George, for forwarding to the board, the uh, city council regulations. Um, I noted in their section about remote participation from board members that they actually require a quorum to be in person and that if somebody's going to be a, a counselor is going to be remote that uh, they're not required for a quorum and that they have to give notice ahead of time which to me and they have a list of reasons which I'm not sure we want to get that fussy about it, but it seems to me like one of the things that's baked in there is that it's not just the assumption that the applicants and some of us will be here, but I think the default assumption is that everybody's going to be here unless they explicitly say otherwise, and there's really some kind of extenuating circumstances like childcare or illness or something like that. Um, and it seemed to me like the needing a quorum to be on site means that if you need somebody online for a quorum and something goes wrong and they can't make it or whatever, the meeting can mm -hmm. still proceed. So I don't want to get into a situation where we're all here and the applicants here and everybody's ready to go. And then because the mics are broken, we have to move the meeting. Um, counting on that other board member to fill out the quorum. Right. Yep. Right. Or just for some other technical yep. issue. Um, I mean, I also, as I expressed last time, strongly to prefer to be here in person. I find the hybrid, even just messing with the microphones, is distracting and annoying and takes away from the meeting. But um, I think it's important that people be able to participate. So I'm willing to do it and make it more possible for people to participate online, but in a more controlled format. Um, for our benefit, for Carolyn's benefit, for the flow of the meetings, um, I don't think uh, we can or should do it quite the same way that um, City Council does it. So um, I made myself some notes because I read through the kind of thoughts that George wrote down. Um, I think um, I like the idea of having everybody here in council chambers gets sort of first crack at public comment. Um, and then if there's anybody on Zoom who still wants to make public comment about something new that hasn't already been raised, then they can do so under a time limit. Um, I don't think we should have chat going simultaneously with verbal comments. I think it's kind of one or the other. Um, and George, one of the questions you asked is, should people be able to make presentations online and I feel strongly no. Um, if they want to make a presentation, they should come here to chambers or if they can't do that because of whatever reason, then they can send it ahead of time. But I that is a whole other kettle of fish in terms of technical issues and I don't even want to know what else. Um, it says anyone who's not the applicant, <laughs> just to be clear, right? The applicant, of course, is here in person. But any, yeah, right. I'm saying people, and we had, uh, I mean, the right. person who came earlier from Day Avenue, you know, they did a PowerPoint presentation here in Chambers, and that was fine. I don't think, I don't want people making like PowerPoint presentations online. Sure. Um, so nobody should be making presentations, not the applicant, not, not right. the public. Um, I, my other thought is that if there are board members online, that it would, be helpful to have a way to somehow kind of pin them or set it up so that we can see them and have an easy way to also see when they want to participate because that's the other thing they're they're sitting there but I guess they're going to raise their hand or do something but just some easy way before public comment to know to make sure that they're engaged in the flow of conversation yep. um, that's just a technical issue but no. yeah I think if you make the board members a co-host then they pop up to the top so you, okay. they'll be yeah, and sometimes we've all been on Zoom meetings when it's distracting because one of the participants is wandering around the room, they're making tea, they're doing whatever. I think tonight's a good example. There's about 11 participants on Zoom, but they all have their video off except for some still shots. So nobody is kind of actively have their video on. And I think that's a good kind of protocol to have also, unless you're actually making public comment, you know, your video stays off and you're coming through on audio. Um, of course, for someone, somebody can also participate just by telephone. 
um, where there's no video, perhaps video component, but by and large, um, we would ask people to keep their video off and that'll allow us to focus on the presenter, his or her plans and the other board member if they're outside. I'm not, Thank you. I'm not overly concerned about people's video being on mostly because if it's an, if an applicant's presentation is up, we're not going to be able to see anybody. Any, I mean, the presentation is going to take up most of the screen, but I don't feel super strongly that I need to see people either, other than perhaps, I don't know, I guess if you're going to come to the meeting, like come to the meeting. Yeah. But yes. that's not a huge issue for me. So, yeah, we talked about having a time limit, much as if there's a full crowd here for a hearing um, pre, pre pandemic. We would have a three minute limit for folks and we would try to maintain that just so, so folks kind of self regulated themselves also. Um, and I think we could do that on zoom um, before each meeting. If we have a set of steps or protocols, the chair can kind of read through those also to make sure everybody understands that um, what's expected of them. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't think we should, if people can um, speak to us um, from the virtual podium. And then I don't think the chat feature really has a play, has a role in this game. It gets distracting if we're looking at chat and we're also looking for raised hands. So And people are chatting about what somebody's talking at the same time, and that gets really going crazy. So I think it's I, no problem having people speak their mind in person, um, but we disconnect the chat. And, uh, you know, we've run uh, many of these meetings when we've had a large amount of people by saying, you know, okay, does anybody out there have anything to say that hasn't already been said? Right. Just because we're all just trying to, yep. you know, keep things moving. Right. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, not have a lot of reiteration. Well, and I think David spoke to that as well in the email that, you know, I think it probably bears um, um, repeating at each meeting that, you know, when issues are raised, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a popular vote process that the board is going through. So if five people say they're concerned about traffic, it's still one issue. It's not five issues. Right. And we hear it. We hear it when it's written to us. We hear it when it's chatted to us. We hear it when it's said to us. We hear it. Yep. Um, and, and you know, people have to trust that we are hearing that. Right. <clears throat> um, and it's, you know, it's public comment. It's not public debate. You know, and I think we do a really good job of taking in everybody's comments and making lists and solidifying things and then going back and trying to hit everything. But it's, um, you know, we're not, we're not here to argue with folks. We're here to hear their opinion and, and not. Nope, exactly. And then we are the, the folks who take those comments in and that list of, uh, the, the list of comments, the patterns we see and address those with the applicant and try to get as cogent an answer as possible for the people in the public. Um, did folks get to see David's short little um, email or should I read that out loud? That's hot. All right, if you'll spare me for just a moment then. Um, to that, it's prudent for the chair to review the comment guidelines briefly, every meeting, underline briefly. I don't have strong feelings about hybrid or in person. There are pros and cons to each. Conversation is better in person but maybe there's more member participation in hybrid virtual. I would encourage one, a, uh, a more tightly managed Zoom format if hybrid or virtual is chosen in terms of people's ability to unmute themselves. More strict time limits for hearing with many com commenters, five or six. No repeat commenters, the applicant is an exception. Think about some kind of sign up for an amat for crowded hearings to prevent confusion in the moment when we get into that raised hands and someone doesn't raise their hand with uh, the virtual hand, but they're waving in the background. So I'm not sure how we would do that sign up format, but we could kind of walk through that. Um, 
and a bit about uh, people being able to unmute themselves. I don't think that happens, right? Just the co-chairs do that. I mean, we can set it now so that, um, I mean, council does that, right? When it's the person's time to speak, then they're uh, they're unmuted by They have to unmute themselves as well, which yeah. is, it, it, most people know how to do it at this point. Yeah. But who's control? Who, who in our scenario would be controlling that? If if we said, okay, we're now going to unmute, allow this person to unmute themselves so they can make comment. What it would have to be one of the two yeah, of you, right? right? Because council has they have staff yeah, right. who does that, so it would fall to yeah one of you to do that. Yep. If somebody's at the podium and we want to mute them, it's not quite as easy. <laughs> we have to get out the big gavel then, or I was going to say it's in, right. It's in right. there. Um, Good. Uh, so, Carolyn, o over to you. What what does this mean in terms of your the technical stuff, um, and also being able to take minutes and and it may not be you forever. I understand there there's other people who come in, like uh, uh, yeah. Sarah came in yeah. a while before too. I mean, I think um, for all the sort of um, parameters that you all are discussing. Um, can make it easier to um, to define sort of when people are coming on, when people are coming off. So if you're doing everyone in person and then you're just doing everyone in Zoom, maybe one minute each um, or whatever that time period is and specifying the rules, I think that will make it easier um, and then not going back and forth. So, you know, close all zoom and then return to the meeting here whatever that that would make it um manageable i think and i and i want to note that no matter what you know even if we had a techie or more support here there's always going to be something that happens and it happens at council it happens at council subcommittee meetings so it's just I mean, everybody should know that by now with their phones go on the fritz and, okay. you know, their computers go on the fritz. So, um, you know, it's not a perfect world. And, and in that regard, I don't think it ever will be. Have we ever set a time limit for overall comments, like 30 minutes or? No, I don't think we ever have. We've set individual time limits of three minutes, but never kind of we're going to hear comment now for 45 minutes. No. Yeah, and I think the difference is, and that's where some confusion, I think, especially with the public, gets involved in, in sort of comparing us to city council. City council just takes public comment on whatever, and so they have the ability to do that. Because you're here you're here as a public hearing, um, you need to make sure that anyone who wants to speak about an issue can speak. I mean, you can require that it's new information or new comments. But if you if you sort of artificially create a time limit on the whole thing as opposed to individually, like if you see a lot of people and you say, okay, we just need to do one minute and go from there, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're just drawing a line and there are people who didn't get in because of how long the other people took, then um, it's um, that wouldn't comply with public hearing. Okay, sure. so that makes sense to go meeting for meeting. If we had 100 people waiting, you might say, okay, we really need to limit right. yeah. individual comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we've touched almost on everything. Chris's concerns, again, were some of them around technology, that things are bound to happen. Um, Zoom and our internet connections over time have become more constant um but of course things always happen during storms and whatnot so as carolyn said we've always got to be aware of that um yeah i just want to say i'm fine with going to hybrid but i think with a lot of the parameters that were already mentioned i think we really need to have those in place before we before we go forward and make that switch um kind of know what we're getting into and, it, and the public knows what to expect as well and i I think also that we we uh, if we agree on a set of protocols and some guidelines to do this that we agree on a timetable, you know, twelve meetings or six months, and then we come back together again and talk about it. Not that we won't be tweaking it as time goes on, but it's not yeah. cast in stone for us. And I like the idea of it 
sort of being um like like you said jana like if for us we're here like it, maybe there's going to be a time where one of us wants to be on and we're not available to be here and maybe we talk about that but primarily I, i'm comfortable with us being expected to be here Mm-hmm. You know, in the in the four years that I've been here, although some of it was during COVID, we haven't pushed a meeting once because we didn't have quorum that I can remember. Um, and, you know, the times that people are on vacation, you know, we don't necessarily want them, me, nope. feeling obligated to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I, but anyways, yeah, I think that the, setting the expectation that we're here and then if we do need somebody occasionally remotely we haven't needed that yep. so yep. and we've been down a couple of people the whole time well that's my sense like that there should be a quorum here on site and then if somebody can and wants to join remotely great but we know either way we have what we need yeah. here in chambers yeah i like that idea i like that too i didn't even think that fully remote was an option when we're talking about being here, I just it, it hasn't I, been. Yeah, it hasn't no, I just been. when we're talking about having us expectations that we'll meet here, I just thought that was assumed. But I guess we need to reiterate that we kind of opened it up last week a little bit, talking about you know even potentially going 100 percent remote. Yeah, I don't not that idea here at all. Um, so we kind of opened it back up I a little bit. Good. Good. Any other comments? So. Moving forward, maybe Carolyn and I could collaborate on a short document that lists out these points and kind of draft these guidelines that the chair will read before the meeting briefly, as David says, so that every people in council chambers and on Zoom understand what we're going through. Um, and I think this will help the people that have uh, talked about a lack of um, kind of participation on their part when attending by Zoom. And maybe also it'll get more people to come here to council chambers. Um, and really be here present with the applicant and with the presentation. Um, all right, good. And it doesn't mean if something comes up in the next two weeks, we're not, this isn't a vote on any application or public hearing. It's all about process. If you think of something in the next two weeks, please forward it on to us um, and we'll add it. And then we'll we'll review these one more time. Maybe we'll talk about our summer schedule tonight. I don't know if we're there. Yeah, we should do that. Summer schedule, and then we'll kind of vote on it. Great. Well, thank you very much for working through this. And thanks to all you folks out there um, in the Zoom world who have uh, kind of stayed on top of this with us. Okie doke. So what else is on our agenda? I believe. We're, we don't have any ANRs. Um so I think we do need to discuss July and August, mm-hmm. um, what makes sense for most of you. So typically you take, you know, you just do one meeting in July and August. There are a couple of permits. What day is today? June. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of permits for the end of July um, I'm sorry, end of June. Sorry. Um, so I don't know what works. The meeting dates in July um, <clears throat> would be the second Thursday is July 11th. See the 11th and the 25th. Or the 8th and the 22nd um, in August. I know I am out on the August 8th. I think what worked well last year is we did a quick, quick little email thread okay. among us all, and we kind of voted on okay. what was available when, especially for David. And so if we could do that again, that would be okay. helpful because I don't have a nice Google calendar like that. <laughs> oh, okay. We could do it. Someday. You're, you're going to be running these Zoom meetings. Wow. It's terrible. Okay, that's great. Great. I'd also like to suggest that one of those summer meetings, we if it's a short agenda, maybe we get together afterwards and have a little bite together and a little something, kind of socialize, that word socialize. Sounds all right. That would be fun. You know. Um, When's our new person coming? 
It started through the council process. Okay. <laughs> My ethics thing. I wanted to sort of figure out some way of violating. Yeah. Not yeah. Watch it. It's just dark. Yeah. And you're even in a tougher situation because you're in a con construction area, you know, where you may run into these folks more often than that. Maybe you have, there's more time, there's more situations perhaps where you may have a little conflict of interest. Oh. Yeah. There's no conflict. It's all my interest. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, should we entertain a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I move we adjourn. Oh, I'll second. Motion has been made by Janet, seconded by Sam to adjourn at 8. Let's say 8.05. I'm going to get home before the first half is over with some game. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Thank you very much.